Okay, guys, so this is The Immortal Life of Henry Atalax by Rebecca Scrooge, and this is part three, Immortality. We begin a new section, and so on chapter 23, it's alive. Okay, so let's dive. On a hazy day in 1973, in a brown brick row, house five doors down from her own, Babette Lax sat at her friend Gardenia's dining room table. Gardenia's brother-in-law was in town from Washington, D.C., and they'd adults all finished having lunch. As Gardenia clanked dishes in the kitchen, her brother-in-law asked Babette what she did for a living. When she told him she was a patient aide at Baltimore City Hospital, he said, Really? I work at the National Cancer Institute. They talked about medicine and Gardenia's plans, which covered the windows and counters. Those things would die in my house. Bet said, and they laughed. Where are you from, anyway? He asked. North Baltimore. No kidding. Me too. What's your last name? Well, it was Cooper, but my married name is Lax. Your name, your last name is Lax? Yeah, why? That's funny, he said. I've been working with these cells in my lab for years, and I just read this article that said they came from a woman named Henrietta Lax. I've never heard that name anywhere else. Bobette laughed. <laughs> My mother-in-law's Henrietta Lacks, but I know you're not talking about her. She's been dead almost 25 years. Henrietta Lacks is your mother-in-law? He asked, suddenly excited. Did she die of cervical cancer? Bobette stopped smiling and snapped. How'd you know that? Those cells in my lab have to be hers, he said. They're from a black woman named Henrietta Lacks who died of cervical cancer at Hopkins in the 50s. <gasps> what? Bobette yelled, jumping up from her chair. What do you mean you got her cells in your lab? He held his, amps, he held his hands up like, whoa, wait a minute. I ordered them from a supplier just like everybody else. What do you mean everybody else? Bobette snapped. What supplier? Who's got cells for my mother-in-law? It was like a nightmare. She'd read in the paper about the syphilis study Tuskegee, which had just stopped by the government after 40 years. And now here was Gardenia's brother-in-law, saying Hopkins had part of Henrietta alive and scientists everywhere doing research on her and the family had a no idea. It was like all those terrifying stories she had heard about Hopkins her whole life were suddenly true and happening to her. If they were doing research on Henrietta, she thought. It's only a matter of time before they come for Henrietta's children. And maybe grandchildren. Gardenia's brother-in-law told Bobette that Henrietta cells had been all over the news lately because they had been causing problems by contaminating other cultures. But Bobette just kept shaking her head saying, How come nobody told her family part of her was still alive? I wish I knew, he said. Like most researchers, he'd never thought about what the woman behind Gila cells had given them voluntarily. Babette excused herself and ran home, bursting through the screen door into the kitchen, yelling for Lawrence. Part of your mother, it's alive! Lawrence called his father to tell him what Babette had heard, and Dave didn't know what to think. Henrietta's alive, he thought. It didn't make any sense. He'd seen her body at the funeral in Clover himself. Did they dig? Go dig it up? Or maybe they did something to her during that autopsy? Lawrence called the main switchboard at Hopkins, saying, I'm calling about my mother, Henrietta Lax. You got some of her alive in there. When the operator couldn't find a record of a patient named Henrietta Lax in the hospital, Lawrence hung up and didn't know who else to call. Soon after Lawrence called Hopkins, in June of 1973, a group of researchers gathered around a table at Yale University at the first international workshop of human gene mapping, a first step toward the Human Genome Project. They were talking about how to stop HeLa contamination problem when someone pointed out the whole mess could be sorted out if they found genetic markers specific to Henrietta and used them to identify which cells were hers and which weren't. But doing that would require DNA samples from her immediate family. Preferably her husband, 
as well as for children, to compare their DNA to HeLa, oh, to compare the DNA to HeLa's and create a map of Henrietta's genes. Victor Markusik, one of the scientists who'd first published Henrietta's name, happened to be at that table. He told him he could help. Henrietta's husband and children were still patients at Hopkins, he said, so finding them wouldn't be difficult. As a physician on staff, Markusik had access to their medical records and contact information. The geneticists at the conference were thrilled. If they had access to DNA from Henrietta's children, they could not only solve the contamination problem, but also study Henrietta's cells in entirely new ways. Makusik agreed, so he turned to, the, to one of his postdoctoral fellows, Susan Sue, and said, As soon as you get back to Baltimore, get this done. Makusik didn't give Sue instructions for explaining the research to Lexus. All she knew was that Victor Makusik had told her to call the family. He was like a god, Sue told me years later. He was a famous, famous man. He trimmed most of the other famous medical geneticists in the world. When Dr. Makusik said, you go back to Baltimore, get this blowout drawn, I did it. When Sue got home from the conference, she called Day to ask if she could draw blood from his family. They say, they said they got my wife and she part life, he told me years later. They said they had been doing experiments on her and they wanted to come test my children to see if they got cancer that killed their mother. But Sue hadn't said anything about testing the children for cancer. There was no such thing as a cancer test, and even if there had been, Makusik's lab wouldn't have been doing one because he wasn't a cancer researcher. Makusik was a renowned geneticist who'd found the world's first human genetics department of, Hop of Hopkins, where he maintained a catalogue of hundreds of genes, included several he had discovered himself in Amish populations. He compiled information about genes and the research done onto them into a database called Mendelian Inheritance in Men, the Bible of the field, which now has nearly 20,000 entries and is still going. Mendelian. Makusik and Sue were hoping to use somatic cell hybridization to test Lack's family for several different genetic markers, including a specific proteins called HLA markers. By testing Henrietta's children, they hoped to find out what Henrietta's HLA markers might have been, so they could use those to identify those cells, her cells. Sue had only recently come to America from China, and English wasn't her native language. According to Sue, when she called Day in 1973, she told him this, We come to draw blood, to get HLA, androgen. We do genetic marker profile because we can deduce a lot of Henrietta Lack's genotype from the children and the husband. When I asked her if Day seemed to understand, Sue said, They were very receptive to us when I made the phone call. They were pretty intelligent. I think Mr. Lax pretty much already knew that his wife made a contribution and are aware of the value of HeLa cells. They probably heard people talking that the cell line is such an important thing. Everybody talking about Gila back then. They are a very nice family, so they very nicely let us draw blood. Sue's accent was strong, and so was Day's. He spoke with a southern country drawl, so thick his own children often had a hard time understanding him. But language wasn't their only barrier. Day wouldn't have understood the concept of immortal cells or HLA markers coming from anyone, accent or not. He'd only gone to school for four years of his life, and he'd never studied science. The only kind of cell he'd heard was of the kind of Zachariah was living in out at Hagerstown. So, he did what he always done when he didn't understand something a doctor said. He nodded and said yes. Years later, when I asked Mac Kusik if anyone had tried to get informed consent from the Lex family, he said, I suspect there was no effort to explain anything in great detail, but I don't believe anyone would have told them we were testing for cancer because that wasn't the case. They'd have just said, your mother had cancer, 
The cells from that cancer have been growing all over the place and studied in great detail. In order to understand that better, we would like to have that blood from your people. When I asked who Susan Sue, the same questions he said, No, we never get consent from because you just go to draw blood. We are not doing some kind of medical research, you know, not long term. All we wanted is a few tubes of blood and to do generic market test. It's not involved in human research committee or things like that. Although this attitude wasn't uncommon at the time, NIH guidelines stipulated that all human subject research funded by NIH, as McCusick's was, required both informed consent and approval for from at Hopkins Review Board. Those guidelines had been implemented in 1966 in the aftermath of the Southam trial and then expanded to include a detailed definition of informed consent in 1971. They were in the process of being codified into law when Sue called A. McCusick began his research on the Lax family at the time of great flux in research oversight. Just one year earlier, in response to the Tuskegee and several other unethical studies, the Department of Health, Education and Wel Welfare, Hugh, H-E-U-W, had launched an investigation into federal oversight of human subject research and found it to be inadequate. As one government report said, it was a time filled with widespread confusion about how to assess risk, as well as refusal by some researchers to cooperate. With oversight and indifference by those charged with administering research and its rules at local institutions, after halting the Tuskegee study, Hugh proposed new protections of human subject regulations that would require, among other things, informed consent. A notice inviting public comment on that proposed new law would be published in the Federal Register, in October 1973, just a few months after Sue called Day. After Day got off the phone with Sue, he called Lawrence, Sonny, and Deborah, saying, You got to come over to the house tomorrow. Doctors from Hopkins coming to test everybody's blood to see if y'all got cancer your mother had. When Henrietta died, Day had agreed to let her doctors do an autopsy because they told him it might help his children someday. They must have been telling the truth, they thought. Zachariah was in a Henrietta's womb when she first got the cancer, and he'd had all those anger problems ever since. Now Deborah was almost 24, no much younger than Henrietta had been when she died. It made sense that they were calling saying it was time for her to get tested. Deborah panicked. She knew her mother had gotten sick at 30, so she'd long feared her own 30th birthday figuring that whatever happened to her mother at that age would happen to her too. And Deborah couldn't stand the idea of her own children growing up motherless, like she had. At that point, Latonia was two. Alfred was six and Cheetah had never paid child support. Deborah had tried welfare for three months but hated it, so now she was working days at the suburban Toys R Us that took more than an hour on three buses to get to the nights at a hamburger place called Gino's behind her apartment. Since Deborah couldn't afford a babysitter, her boss at Gino's let Tony and Alfred sit in the corner of the restaurant at night while Deborah worked. On her eighty on her eight thirty night dinner break, Deborah would run behind the building to her apartment and put the children to bed. They knew not to open the door unless they heard her secret knock and they never put the kerosene lamps near a curtain or blanket. Deborah practiced fire drills with them in case something went wrong while she was at work, teaching them to crawl to the window, throw out a sheet rope she kept tied to the bed leg, and climb to safety. Those children were all Deborah had, and she wasn't going to let anything happen to them. So when her father called saying Hopkins wanted to test if she had her mother's cancer, Deborah sobbed, saying, Lord, don't take me away from my babies. Not now, not after everything we've been through. A few days after Susan Sue phone call, Day, Sonny, Lawrence, and Deborah all sat around Lawrence's dining room table as Sue and a doctor from Makusika's lab collected tubes of blood from each of them. 
For the next several days, Deborah called Hopkins again and again, telling the switchboard operators, I'm calling for my cancer results. But none of the operator knew, operators knew what test she was talking about or where to send her for help. Soon, Sue wrote a letter to Lawrence asking if she could send a nurse out to Hagerstown to collect samples from Zachariah in prison. She concluded a copy of the George Guy tribute written by McCusick and Jones, saying she thought Lawrence would like to see an article about his mother's cells. No one in the family remembers reading that article. They figure Lawrence just put it in a drawer and forgot about it. The lax men didn't think much about their mother's cells or the cancer tests. Lawrence was working full-time on the railroad and living in a house filled with children. Zachariah was still in jail, and times had gotten tough for Sonny, who was now busy selling drugs. But Deborah couldn't stop worrying. She was terrified that she might have cancer, and consumed with the idea that researchers had done, and were perhaps still doing, horrible things to her mother. She heard the stories about Hopkins as nudging black people for research, and she'd read an article in Jet about the Tuskegee study that suggested doctors might actually inject those men with syphilis in order to study them. The injection of disease causing organisms into unaware human subjects has occurred before in American medical science, the article explained. It was done eight years ago in New York City by Dr. Chester Southam, a cancer specialist who injected live cancer cells into chronically ill elderly patients. Deborah started wondering of if instead of testing the lax children for cancer, Makusik and Sue were actually injecting them with the same bad blood that had killed their mother. She started asking Day a lot of questions about Henrietta. How did she get sick? What happened when she died? What did those doctors do to her? The answer seemed to confirm her fears. Day told her Henrietta hadn't seemed sick sick at all. He said he took her to Hopkins. They started doing treatments. Then her stomach turned black, a skull, and she died. Sadie said the same thing, and so did all the other cousins. But when she asked what kind of cancer her mother had, what treatments the doctor gave her, and what part of her was still alive, the family had no answers. When one of Makusik's assistants called Deborah and asked her to come into Hopkins to give more blood, she went, thinking that if her family couldn't answer questions about her mother, maybe the scientist would, could. She didn't know the blood was for a researcher in California who wanted some samples for his own healer research, and she didn't know why Makusik's assistant was calling her and not her brother's. She figured it was because the problem her mother had didn't affect boys. She still thought she was being tested for cancer.